Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, greetings from New York and uh, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for spending your weekend with us um, on this important discussion we are going to have. And before I call upon the speakers and make introductory remarks, there are a few housekeeping rules. Uh, when you are not speaking, I request that you kindly mute your mic and also switch off your camera because we don't realize we are moving around and that is, uh, you know, it goes on the screen. And um, the question and answers will be at the end of the session. And as you can see, there is a Q&A um, and there's also chat. If you need to please type in your questions there. And uh, before we start, I just want to um, thank Ada for Dr. Ada Okika for all her passion and activism. And thank you, Ada, for making me a part of your team. We've been in this for more than 10 years. So I think it's, uh, you know, and I hope we go on for the next uh, 10 years because this is also the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. And we are facing unprecedented times. Um, because a virus, uh, coronavirus, has really brought the world to a standstill. But thank you, technology, because we are able to talk and connect. Mm, and uh, as the governments around the world are taking urgent action to save lives, and uh, what happens after the lockdown is what we all need to be putting our thinking caps on and discuss. And it's really my honor and privilege to moderate this panel where we really have esteemed speakers on from actually all over the world. So it's really a great virtual global conference. Um, a very brief introduction about myself. My name is uh, Padmini Murthy. I'm always uh, known as Mini since I was a kid. And um, I'm a physician, an activist, an author, a mother and uh, passionate about women's uh, health issues. And I also am an NGO representative to the United Nations from uh, my NGO, Medical Women's International Association and the American Medical Women's Association. We were founded over 100 years ago and uh, we are working um, to promote health and well-being. So the purpose of this program is to create content for community education reducing emerging st self-stigma, negative emotional health, and to build healthy confidence uh, in the minds of people while also we work on the social well-being and um, economic uh, well-being. So the goal of this conference, we hope at the end of this two hour, two and a half hour session, is to ensure that as the global lockdown stops, we slowly take baby steps again and come uh, come back to normal. So the way it goes, we have a program, we have panel discussion, and uh, which we really have great panel panelists. And it gives me great pleasure to kick off the meeting to call upon our first guest, His Excellency, Ambassador Denise Antoine, former ambassador, extraordinaire, and pl uh, Plenty Potenary Embassy of Grenada in Beijing. Uh, both Ada and myself have known the ambassador and had the privilege of working with him. He's an amazing champion for uh, women's causes and rights. And also Ambassador Antoine has many uh, feathers in his cap, but the most important thing I would like to talk uh, discuss is he served as the vice president of the United Nations General Assembly, the 69th United Nations General Assembly. And he also served as the United, um, uh, as his country, Grenada's representative to the United Nations, where he was like, uh, excuse me, Ambassador, I used this term to describe you, a live wire. And he really worked so much with the NGO community and um, got a lot of things going. So without much ado, I, it gives me great pleasure to call upon um, Ambassador Denise Antoine. Sir, you have eight minutes. And again, I am a pretty tough moderator. When your time is up, I will just say, excuse me, time is up. Can we move on? So thank you so much. So over now to Ambassador Antoine. Oh 
Um, can we have Ambassador Antoine, please? Yes. I think he's off again. Okay, would you like me to move on to Mr. Glover and then we have Ambassador oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Okay. He's talking, I don't hear him. His mic is on mute. Can he? Yes. Ambassador, sir, could you please unmute yourself? Yeah. What's going on? He's on mute. Why? Hello, Ambassador. We can still hear you. I'm very sorry that uh would you go on proceed without me please okay let's see if we can have um okay Ada do you want me to call upon our next speaker now yes so after that we'll call him back sure now it's my honor and privilege to call upon uh, Mr. Danny Glover, who needs no introduction. He's one of my favorite actors. And um, more than his on-screen acting, he's known for his political activism. And uh, he also serves as the glo global ambassador to UNICEF and UNDP. Mr. Glover, thank you for your time. And uh, from all of us, we salute you for your activism, sir and look forward to seeing you in person once the COVID breakdown um, is finally over, the lockdown and the breakdown. That was a pun because a lot of people are breaking down during the lockdown and it's conferences like these and listening to people like you, which make us go on. So um, Mr. Glover, the floor is yours and we look forward to hearing your views on the global perspective of education. Thank you, sir. Well, First of all, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with um, uh, today, uh, and, and particularly as we face an extraordinary moment in human history. I don't need to tell those who are, who are on this this Zoom call and who are part of this conference and this debate or discussion that we are here at a very extraordinary moment in human history with very... Uh, it, also, that this moment has extraordinary dangers as well as extraordinary possibilities. I've been able to work with the the United Nations in some capacity uh, over the last 25 years, whether it's as a goodwill ambassador for UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, as its first appointed goodwill ambassador, uh, or uh, with uh, UNICEF. Uh, the United Nations uh, Children's Emergency Relief Fund. And, and certainly the issues that we've talked, spoke about for those per this period of time and beyond that are the issues around the millennium goals and reducing poverty and access to health care, access, access to education, and ac ac access to, to those things that, that are necessary to sustain us, and I say sustain our communities as well. We are at, at this crisis where we 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 we, we understand that that one that it how it is affect the uh, the the world, but particularly the uh, the uh, of the world that that of, of not not so much the global south, but it's it's, it's affected the. The, the more more uh, developed countries, those that we know about that, and and if if, if that situation is drastic for people within those countries, imagine what it does it means for people in the global south. The the information that we need to have 
the information that we need to be to use as as a platform to make a better world is there. Our objective has always been to make a better world. And for the particularly all human beings, but for people of the global south particularly, specifically, excuse me, specifically. So where, where do we begin to go with these, this conversation? We understand clearly that this, the system of organizing healthcare, of organizing uh, economic growth and development have been broken right up now. And there's no sort of sense that, and it's no conversation that would lead us to a real resolution of the inherent problems of the system if we're not, if we're not talking about transformation. And what does that transformation look like? And what role we play as individuals and what play role we play collectively is critical. It's critical because it could also, uh, in the face of conflict and trauma, and major, this is collective trauma. The trauma that we, we talk about is not only an economic trauma, but an emotional trauma as well. If we're not able to grab, the, grab hold of that and, un, and understand that the that we're we're entitled to and have a right to those things that the, 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 that are in the UN and charter a charter. Then we 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 miss this moment and the possibility of a much more dangerous moment is at hand as well. So it is interest it's, it is is essential that we 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 talk and we speak truth to power at this moment. Whether that moment was in our our, our that, that truth to power and speaking that truth is to our, our elected officials, uh, those, uh, those who work on behalf of us in governance, those who work on behalf of us in civil society. And it is important that we continue, continue this work, but we have to continue this work, not only simply to tell people to do what, what is obvious and what is needed, that is to, to one, to uh, protect ourselves, uh, with, with social distancing when we can, but how can you talk about social distancing when you have places in the world where, they, where people are unable to socially distance themselves? You know, we've experienced uh, and certainly as I as I've experienced uh, over over a period of time doing given my relationship with with Africa and 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 the Caribbean and Latin America, I've experienced the hardship that have existed there pre uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, we had Ebola in, 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 and certainly uh, just recently within, within the, just a, a short period of time uh, in, 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 in countries that were, that were unprepared to, to deal with the, that fact. So we had that crisis. So the crises that we see that have not only a big, we're going to be crises that, that will, will continue, but also uh, and, and show up unexpectedly, but we're going to have to be more prepared for that. And specifically within our communities, as we talk about uh, uh, the, 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 the communities with, who have been historically within uh, the United States and other uh, communities, advanced economies, we have to do the, the work that's necessary that I have to do our, our, own, our own hard work that's necessary. And as I say, speak the truth to it, and, and create another level of activism that we perhaps have not seen since those moments of decolonization and the uh, and self determination. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your inspiring remarks. Uh, we really appreciate it, and thank you for your time and the hope. Uh, you will uh, be on the call. Uh, we do really appreciate your time, your passion and activism, and you're really a role model for so many people. And uh, you know, I hope so many of our young people, once uh, hopefully we are taping this, and they will uh, watch the link later on and um, see for themselves how, what a difference people like you have made. You're really a star. Thank you again, sir. Uh, so, uh, Ambassador Antoine, are you ready to go on now? If not, Look, sir, I will call you. I am, I am. You. Yes, I am. Okay, thank you, sir. It's so nice to see you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, oh my God, we really missed that laugh. <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> and the mic is all yours now. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Uh...
Would the presentation be up or would it begin? Yes, um, good morning. I believe that um, we, I had a slow start. I'm very pleased to be with you. Uh, this morning we are beginning to rethink our world. We have to rethink the future and begin to think about new models of socialization. As those of you who are at home, in isolation, in seclusion, suddenly realize that if you're a parent, your home is a playground, your home is a school, and you're wondering if you would survive. So we are about rethinking the future. I believe that the speed of change is not imagined. We cannot imagine the speed of change. Therefore, the process of rethinking our future requires imagining, a lot of imagination, because it is too difficult to predict how things will change. We have first to imagine what? What will we teach our children? What information can we share? A critical first step is finding, is finding the, the right way of socializing with each other again. We have first to imagine that we are in a phase of this pandemic that individuals and communities that are in lockdown would not remain stuck in lockdown. We have to develop and initiate rescue plans. We have to assess and begin our recovery findings. And then we have to begin to build back better. Now, collaboration has to be a collective and inclusive and a sharing mode, identifying the best modes of socialization that can be replicated. A critical first step is feeding the future. Now, food security. We at this time see how the pandemic is creating anxiety over access to the proper foods. Now, reconnecting the social networks and the supply chains. Remember, we have to know how to regulate to ensure quality and safety for all. Sustained efforts to combat disparity. Now disparity is a demonstration of what is happening to poor people, black people, people in underserved areas. They are the victims that are being put in body bags. Unfortunately, we have to say that. Public space reorganization with new protocols, universal standards. We have to know where it's working and how we can share. So we have to be in an all-inclusive mode. So this morning, I think the initiative that we have undertaken is one of great, great visioning the future. I look forward to how we will, in the NGOs and the community agencies, will begin to work as a collective, as I have said. So what information can we share? Talk about the alternative days for schools. How, how will we teach to be more flexible? We have to reimagine child care centers and schools, knowledge sharing and good practices, not because it works here, it will work everywhere. How do we communicate with the old network infrastructure that we've had? Digital learning and distance learning has to be 
or what is called operationalized to reach where it's not reaching today. So we're talking about the old concept, connectivity, which never reached where it ought to have been reaching. Create a platform for dialogue on best practices. This is the beginning. The best teaching and the best practices and a dialogue agenda that will leave no one behind this time. So, as we begin to look at homeschooling, you know, reskilling, retraining, this is where we have to begin because there is a need for a new normal, a new normal. So parent-teacher communication, parents and homeschooling, access to quality food, as I mentioned, during school time. We cannot just run to a fast food store anymore. We have to begin to be our own nutritionists. And we have to have that consciousness. So I believe it's a new mode of communication. I look forward to how we would reconnect the social network that are now under lockdown. And so today, I am pleased to join this imminent group. We have to talk a lot about travel and, and the environment. We have to talk about telehealth. Remember today, you can call your doctor if you have one and communicate with him, on, him or her on the phone to get treatment. There are those who are ill and can't reach a clinic, can't reach a doctor. So telehealth must be for everyone. Online commerce must be for everyone. There would be less retail, a lot of automatic checkouts. We have to promote less contact, land, air, and sea travel. How would it be different? How will social distances continue to work? We have to talk about hygiene in the restaurants, in the bar, in the shops. Now, grocery stores, essential workers, and health records, making it safe again to move about. How do we isolate and at the same time communicate? The role of government and citizens, that is civic responsibility, and the importance of data and information. How do we disaggregate the data so it reach the small population, the inner city population? So well-coordinated, clear national, state, and local policies would be needed. Be sitting, setting the stage for healthy living. The economy has to be resuscitated. Job creation online would require, you know, I guess, retaining for certain age group. We have to retrain certain age group. Small and medium enterprises, challenges for the social sector. So the preparedness, remember, for dealing with the impact of COVID-19 on lockdown. What comes to mind, as I am going to close, is the possible spike in the birth rate. <laughs> We have to talk about how pediatrics would begin its, its surveillance on this process, dealing with an invisible presence going forward, knowing that COVID-19 is in our midst. So many will be working remotely. And I too hope that we would empower and enable those who have left behind and are the largest group of victims, we bring them forward. Let's leave no one behind. Thank you, Your Excellency, uh, for your inspiring remarks and your sense of humor, which we all in New York really miss. The one thing I just wanted to add, you talked about telehealth. Let me tell you, I'm teaching my medical students and graduate students online. It's an interesting experience, but you know, at least their curriculum was not interrupted. Their semester went on and they're graduating. So 
this is, you know, more power to technology using it in the right way. Thank you again, sir. Um, and uh, thank you for uh, staying with us. I'm sure people have lots of questions. I already see uh, questions uh, coming up on Q&A. And our next speaker is Dr. Kalita Alston-Jones, who's an oncologist, a clinical consultant, and medical director from New York. And thank you, Dr. Alston-Jones. The mic is now yours. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. I'm grateful to be a part of this panel. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and dive in a little bit um, from the medical aspect about COVID-19 and um, as in regards as well at the end to the after lockdown preparedness. So just to start a little bit um, in the beginning about what COVID-19 actually is. Um, so we know that it's a novel, which, which simply means that it's a new strain of coronavirus that has been known primarily to attack the respiratory system. We do know that it's highly transmittable and infectious and the common symptoms we can see here, fever, cough, shortness of breath, chills, body aches, um, new loss of taste and or smell. Of course, there are some GI symptoms that are also being um, reported with this disease. However, these are the most common symptoms and they usually appear two to 14 days after exposure. And so what we also know some facts going forward is that people who are who have the virus can also be asymptomatic. So this is the major problem that we're experiencing when it comes to the virus spreading is that those who have um, the virus may not have any symptoms at all. And so as of 5 20 when this um, slide was prepared, which I'm sure the number has gone up, of course, there were about 4.25 million cases worldwide and over 294,000 deaths. What we do know is that there is no cure at the moment. Um, possible prom promising treatments. We have remdesivir, which is currently being looked at, and there are some clinical trials that are going on using that drug, which reduces the recovery time um, up to four days. So what they're seeing is hospitalization going from about 14 days to about 10 to 11 days with this drug. Convalescent plasma is something that they're also looking at. So in other words, looking at those who have recovered from the disease and using their plasma to introduce into those who are ill to see if antibodies can be produced. So safety measures, which was talked about. Social distancing, at least six feet to minimize the risk of infection. Frequent hand washing, we know, is something that has been pushed with this um, current disease. Soap and water, at least 20 seconds. Hand sanitizer if soap and water is unavailable. So that should be an alternative, but the primary thing is using soap and water. Masks, we want to talk a little bit about the masks. Um, N95 masks, which are usually reserved for the healthcare professionals. Um, the, the purpose of that mask is that 95% of the particles, if there is a proper fitting, because for these masks, there usually has to be a, a proper fitting to make sure that the mask is um, operating optimally. So when there is a proper fitting, 95% um, of particles, bacteria, viruses um, can be filtered through this mask. KN95 mask or something that we are seeing now which is similar to 95. However, they were created in China according to the, the standards there. The CDC does recommend that when N95 is not available, um, that can, N95 can be used. However, there is a list of manufacturers that they have listed that will meet the standards because of course there are um, counterfeits that are out there. Surgical mask is intended to catch droplets and aerosols from the wearer's mouth and nose to reduce the spread to others. So it's not designed to protect you from breathing in bac bacteria or viruses. The sole purpose of the surgical mask is to protect those that are outside of you from your respiratory droplets. The same thing as the cloth mask. And we see today there are a lot of cloth mask, a lot of different designs that are going on. This does not protect you, again, from viruses invading you, but it does 
um, protect others in case the wearer has the virus. So the purpose is if everyone is wearing, wearing a mask, then there is some um, reciprocal benefit there. So going forward testing, there's antigen testing, which determines if you have active disease, usually done via nasal swab. There's antibody testing that's out now to determine if your body has mounted an immune response to the virus. It's recommended at least three weeks after known infection or possible symptoms. However, we do not know now what this actually means, the results of these tests. Um, there is no data to determine that if you are positive for the antibodies, that you are immune to this virus or how long immunity actually lasts. So there is still ongoing um, trials and investigation to find out what a positive antibody test actually means. Um, so preparation. So, so going forward, um, as has been previously stated, we know that this virus will probably be around for a while. So we do have to prepare. Um, preparation is key. Masks and gloves being readily available. Testing being readily available. Um, continued social distancing. We're going to have to have strict and frequent sanitizing measures. So that's going to be something that businesses um, is going to have to look at. The availability of hand sanitizer in public places and, and you know, that being readily available. Lower occupancy rules. So going forward, businesses are going to have to determine how they can function um, not at full capacity with allowing people to be able to be socially distant from one another. There needs to be screening measures in place. So temperature checks, um, symptom screening to know, you know, if a person has had symptoms in the last few days. So again, there has to be change in business practices. We also have to evaluate a calculated risk. So if you are going out, are you going to go out, um, if you're going out, you know, with friends or family, will you be in an open place um, compared to being inside somewhere that has recirculated air, which can put you at a higher risk? Um, we're also going to need to address the disparities in healthcare and why this disease tends to attack the African American community and Latino community more than any other community. We're going to have to address um, healthcare coverage and making healthcare available for all. We're gonna also have to address medical education, building our immune systems and learning how proper diet and eating properly is going to aid in our being able to fight this disease. And we're gonna also have to address uh, controlling chronic diseases because now it's being seen that a lot of chronic diseases um, are on the rise and not being managed and well controlled because the focus is on COVID-19. And so that's something that we're going to have to look at going forward. And as was already stated, telehealth, which will definitely be the new wave um, of the future going forward. I'm sure there will be less offices that will be, especially in the near future, offering um, a lot of in-person appointments, unless it's absolutely necessary. There will be a lot that will be done via telemedicine, telehealth, and so we're also going to need to discuss um, going forward having internet access available in people's homes because we would be surprised where there are some areas and communities where internet access is not even readily available or even telephone access. And so this is going to be things that we're going to have to look at going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Jones, uh, for your talk and covering a lot of the health aspects. And as a healthcare provider, I think uh, what you brought out is really amazing uh, because it's better to be safe than sorry. So it's better we socially distance for some time yes. and we are keeping in touch using these various uh, tools of technology like WhatsApp and uh, Zoom and you know Google Hangouts and so many things. And before I call upon the panelists uh, from our next panel, I just wanted to say that Kerala uh, in... Um, India, the state of Kerala, has had only four deaths, COVID deaths. 
and it was the first case actually reported. And one of the reasons was for social distancing and also education. They went to the communities. You bring up a very important point, especially among us, the ethnic minorities, that we are often um, you know, shut out of the system, marginalized population. So it's up to all of us to come collectively. And again, um, Dr. Rada, thank you for taping this because it's a great way to tweet it to say what's happening and what can we do. Again, thank you so much for your time. And, um, you know, please be on because I'm sure there'll be questions for you. And sure. thank you for all the work you do in your church, too. Thank you <laughs> thank so you. much. Um, uh, so now we move on, ladies and gentlemen, to our next panel, which is after lockdown preparedness. And I would like to call upon uh, Senator James Sanders, Jr. Um, from New York State. He's the New York State Senator and Chairman of Committee on Banks. Uh, very important. So we need to have him on to talk about the financial aspects. Thank you. Senator James Sanders, thank you, sir. While we wait for our uh, speaker, Senator James Sanders, to come on, may I call upon um, uh, Her Excellency Reverend Dr. Teresa Morton, who's the board chair, the Center for SDG Global Education, Thank you so much, Reverend. We look forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, it is awesome to speak about a topic that is so dear to my heart um, because finances, everybody wants money, need money, or got to do something with money. And the biggest problem that we find with money is that people don't know how to channel it in the direct way. So I value this topic. So COVID-19 has led to a disruption of the financial economy. People were not prepared for their loss of income or being furloughed. This virus serves as the catalyst that helped transform social norms into an unknown. So you're hearing these new phrases, we want to return, this is going to be our new norm, or we want to return to what we used to do. And the reality is this is transforming us into something that's going to be unknown. So one should always be prepared economically, especially when life changes around you. Finances has always been very important in knowing that during this time, individuals don't have to deal by fearful um, paying bills, or worrying about how they're going to control what they have to spend or what they have to take care of. So today I'm going to speak to you about a financial action plan. And having a financial action plan, the biggest word that we're gonna focus on is preparedness, which is a noun. And this often describes referring to a person, place, or thing. So are you prepared with yourself, with the place that you are caring for, whether it's your home or the place of parents, those that are taking care of their parents, or even 
places if you have a business and if the business is able to be ran, then you have things, of course. Are people prepared with the things that they have, such as their phone or their car or even being able to obtain food to process? So the thing about preparedness, according to the Oxford Advanced Learners Dictionary, it shows you to do something. It's the state of being ready or willing to do something. And then if you look at Merriam-Webster's dictionary, it's the quality of state of being prepared. How prepared are you? So then if we look at the next slide that I put together, the next slide shows that we need to learn how to live within your means. Keep your needs simple. Enjoy small pleasures. Real value lies in what things mean to you, not in their cost or how they're valued by others. So a lot of people, when you have finances, they take it and spend it just lavishly in, in any type of lifestyle. And in reality, you have to see if you did not have the money to say you're spending to do things, are you spending it correctly? So one of the individuals that I love, he said it best, Benjamin Franklin, said if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. So by you not planning out what you're going to do, you're not desiring to have a proper goal. So then the next slide that I put together back is showing you means. There's a popular saying that I heard growing up, if you don't have the means, how can you desire to do something? And I wanted to look at means referring to finances being a noun also. It's to intend for a particular purpose, a destination, etc. So your means is money that you're using for a particular purpose and or destination that you want it to go to. But we have to look at, does it bring or cause or produce a result? So a lot of times you spend money to get something in return. So yes, we all have lights or you got water bills, you're getting something and you have to pay for that. But then when you look at, does this mean equip what you need? So a lot of times people are spending on things that doesn't equip nothing else but a lifestyle. So um, you have individuals that are spending money on whether clothes or cars, and now with what's happening today, you're not going out, people at home, so chances are people aren't really wearing half the stuff they're buying, or you're not an essential worker to be out driving. So you're not advertising what you've already gotten. But then... The next slide, one of the biggest thing I want to focus on is being prepared. And when you're preparing for your budget, budgeting is so important. And there are steps to design your budgeting. And the first one is income. How much money do you earn? Some people earn money daily. Some people get a check weekly or semi-monthly or other services rendered, you have to wait until you complete a job before you get paid. And once you list, how, once you have in your hand how much you're making, then you need to list your current bills and your luxury expenses. There's a difference between needs and wants. So a lot of times we need food, but not necessarily the extravagant things. It's a good way to keep track of things you may have or even forgotten you signed up for. So a lot of people sign up for whether the gym, but they're not going to the gym. And when you look at your annual credit card payments or your bank account, you're seeing that, oh my gosh, I'm spending money for a gym membership, but I don't go. So those are things that you need to cancel. And other people sign up for life subscriptions, whether magazines, and you're getting these magazines and you're not really even reading the magazines. So you have to actually cancel that. And that's a way you can save money. But we have to always keep in mind with all our bills that we have to realize how are we gonna pay them? And when you look at them, you can see, does your income cover your expenses? So when you break down, frequency. 
frequency is showing how often do you have to pay these bills. So some bills are paid monthly, some bills are paid quarterly or six months or every annually, every year. And then that can help you determine if you can pay for all of these things based on how often they have to get paid. Then you have your fixed and variable. Fixed bills are bills that remain the same for a period of time. So whether the bill is for three months, again, six months, or annually, such as housing. Your housing, your rent, or your mortgage payment remains the same. If you are paying a car note, the car note is usually the same. Your medical co-pays, whether it's for the year, it's the same. And that is considered a fixed bill. But then you have your variable bills. Variable bills are like cell phones, utilities, and food. And the reason they're variable because they change based on, again, look at your cell phone. If you decide to make a long distance phone call and that's not a part of your plan, you're going to be charged an additional fee. And a lot of times when you get the bill, people are like, oh my gosh, my plan is usually X amount of money, but now it's exorbitant. And the reason it went high is because you didn't consider that long distance call you made cost you. Food, you may only be buying food for just yourself, but if you then change it and have to buy food for the entire family that's coming over, that changes the cost of what you spend on food. So that's what makes it a variable bill. So the purpose of listing will show you if your income can pay for your expense. If not, how prepared will you be for an emergency? Never let your liability exceed your assets. So we must know that during this time of uncertainty, many of us have seen what we can do without. So I like to get ready to close and saying the best way to save money is not to lose it. This pandemic has tested people emotionally, financially, spiritually, and in all other ways. If no other time, now's the time to know where you stand. Make a great stand. If need to, you can collaborate with family, friends, clergy, community. Learn financial literacy and your health to be the best that you can be. Thanks again for this time of sharing. Thank you so much, Reverend, for your wisdom and very practical tips on how to budget I think we all need to see that. And usually it's the women in the families who are, you know, in charge of making sure that uh, you make ends meet. But thank you again and really appreciate your very clear presentation and slides. And now it's my pleasure to call upon uh, Senator James Sanders Jr., who is our New York State Senator and Chairman of the Committee on Banks. Thank you, Senator. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I trust that you can see and hear me. Uh, can you see and hear me? We can hear you, sir, but we are not able to see you as yet. I see. I don't uh, understand how we do that, but I uh, am looking to see. Okay, I don't see any... Oh, wait, wait, I think I can do this. I, I, yes, sir, we can see you. Thank you so much. Okay, I can't see you, but that's all right, as long as you can see me. It is a pleasure. Oh, well, you can see me now. Thank you. You can see all of us. Thank okay, you. Okay, now, now we are together. It is a pleasure to be here. It is a pleasure to uh, speak. I am, even as we speak, delivering masks and different things to the people of, of my community. So if you see boxes in my background, it's uh, because I'm, I'm doing it all. all right. But I see you have a, a different background. All right, I am here to speak of what is the economic situation going on uh, for the different communities, especially the African community in the United States. Um, I make a terrible prediction. I am predicting that at the end of this one, uh, we are going to lose 
at least one third of our businesses that uh, one third of black businesses will not be able to come back. Um, and we're and part of the problem, a small part, but a part of the problem is that we are having trouble with something with what the federal government calls the payroll protection program. Now, this is a program poorly designed, but designed to ensure that uh, businesses uh, stay open. And uh, they put billions of dollars into it, hundreds of billions actually now. And in the first phase, Blacks were able to get very, very little of this. The big boys got most of it. The 1%, the top 10% of the companies in the U.S. took 80% of the money. So that did not leave much money for everyone else. And you had to have a, uh, an ongoing business relationship with bankers. And we really got froze out of those programs. Uh, I worked with my congressman to create a second round of this better, uh, better configured, uh, but still not great. And we have gone through $200 billion in it. The good thing is there is a hundred billion dollars left. And if there are businesses uh, that are trying to get this money, they should first things first, look at the categories, at the criteria from the Department of Small Business Services, uh, then they may speak to their bank if they have a banker. Uh, if all those matters don't, don't work, they can try to speak to my economic development person. And on this issue, that will be a gentleman named Ivan Young. Ivan Young. Uh, we are dealing with a catastrophe in terms of the business community. However, this does open up the possibilities for others who want to create businesses. And I urge people to take the time and to try to create businesses around now, because many of the businesses you see uh, on the store corners may not be there. And that means that a prime location may become available for you. Uh, I will try to stay around to see if there are any questions for me, um, but I will stop there and see if uh, and and see if I can't stay for any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Senator. I'm so glad you are my senator in New York State. Thank you for all the work, sir, and your activism. Um, and, uh, you know, we all need to work together. And again, as I've said, that this is going to really bring up such a positive message from all the illuminary panelists for especially our youth. Um, and that being said, our speak next speaker on this panel is Professor Gregory Ebay, who's Chancellor uh, of um, University, Gregory University, Uturu in Abia State in Nigeria. Sir, thank you so much for calling in from Nigeria. We applaud you for all your efforts in promoting education. The floor is now yours, Professor Ibe. Thank you. Can we please uh, have Professor Gregory Ibe? Thank you. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you, sir. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much um, for the invitation to be part of this conversation um, on education preparedness and impacts, issues and challenges. 
of course, uh, I left Nigeria here on Ma to New York to see my family on the 6th of March. And um, this uh, lockdown met me here and it created a big challenge, not just for us as a university, but uh, created a total disruptive uh, attitude to our consequences of lockdown on all uh, our systems, not just us, but everybody that owns a school or operates a school system. We're talking that 212 countries and 1.6 million kids are totally uh, out of school. It reminds me of one of our greatest musicians who said to us, when are we going to reach the promised land? We're coming from the developed uh, um, country. Permit me to add, for how long shall we wait for our teachers and students alike before they go back to classroom? Whether you are a school proprietor or headmaster, principal, whether you are in primary school or secondary school level, whether you are part of us that uh, are chancellors or vice chancellors, provosts, that are various levels of uh, higher education, you should be concerned that your school is just out of session. What do we do? This is a time to think smartly outside the box for gap filling solutions at the exist, as this is strategy of the infinite, uh, indefinite lockdown. We must work on the psychological impact of lockdown in that uh, induced fear and anxiety to our parents and our wards. This is applicable to teachers and other staff within the uh, institutions of learning. They are important for reopening. These are important for reopening of schools and maintaining the uh, psychology for effective learning process. However, to navigate this challenge of unpreparedness of the school environment without backlash, government agencies should work in concert with international organizations, private sector partners, and civil society to deliver education by a remote learning system to ensure continuity of curriculum-based study, despite the fact that e-learning, despite the fact that e-learning as a crisis study is still involving, involving in the sense that for a country or developing countries, example, in Nigeria, <laughs> online is, um, is still a taboo. Um, the, 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 the uh, NUC I just licensed a few uh, years ago about four universities to go into this uh, attitude of uh, uh, doing distant learning. And then our own and our university, Open University, is also trying to adopt it. So it, becomes a, it became a problem. For us at our university, we kick-started on, on online learning because I came to uh, Kennesaw State University some two years ago, and I started to work on online at my university. So today we use Zoom platform. We have also encouraged all course representatives in various levels to set up WhatsApp groups of names of scholars and course lecturers. The arrangement is necessary to hold scheduled interactive lecture delivery for maximum of 60 uh, 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 minutes of Zoom time limit. Um, anyway, we need to thank the Zoom for giving us that opportunity as well. The university management has approved data allowances for lecturers as incentive so that these lectures can go on uninterrupted because they are, they are also new to it, but uh, they need to money uh, to, to get the data, which is equally costly. Uh, one encouraging feedback we are getting is that the report from the Savicom Directorate of the University is very encouraging. We believe that so far with the push button approach, it has been said that we could make a stronger statement on sustainable, sustainable equitable and quality education uh, access in developing countries. We are therefore ready to partner with other institutions to boost our success story. Of course, this success story that we are talking about is, is something that, uh, uh, that can be replicated across uh, developing nations uh, with the help of others. 
the impact of the lockdown on educational system, like I will always say, is a state ra uh, radical reform in terms of curriculum content building. Pedagogy, monitoring and evaluation. Root learning has been displaced with te techno innovation taking over as key teaching and learning tools in post COVID-19 period. We look forward to the resurgence of e-learning in schools with only teachers who have skills upgrade in terms of teacher learning interactions, as well as time and data management for the learning revolution. Again, policy managers must put in place strategies to allay fears and anxiety and mitigate challenges that confront the learners, teachers, parents, and caregivers. Because we find out that some teachers are already getting g going into this uh, aspect because they think they might lose their job. My, my, few people might be involved in teaching. Borrowing from the Bank of America uh, uh, the, the, on the great lockdown, it presents a great uh, discussion in microeconomic estimates that since 1960, and needs indiscriminate abundantly gets to flatten the cover of personal and corporate bankruptcies, sustain the fight against leak back of the pandemic. Of course, uh, challenges come for developing nations as well, and uh, both developed and developing nations. Africa suffers technology, infrastructure, and financial deficit. You can imagine what's going on in Africa by now, because I don't think all the public schools are anywhere near uh, resumption uh, or learning. Corporate social responsibility is difficult in Africa for a number of reasons. Lack of credible data, high tax obligations on uh, expected corporate providers. Africa has low hydrocarbon funds. Online learning from, from examples uh, uh, from China, Egypt. The same thing like Nigeria, because the, the, these companies pay high level of uh, money uh, in order to be given access to operate in the country. There's need to construct additional network to boost online capacity learning. Of course, the, the satellite must be deployed uh, going forward if this thing is, and then so that it'd be cheaper for anybody to do. But the good news are online learning has high potential to boost digital economies. I think for those who run away from it, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown that humanity is one. Knowledge is transferable and e-learning platform present, present a great opportunity to share knowledge across the world. In the transition from uh, remote learning to remote learning, partnership leverages in the roadmap to sustainable and equitable and quality education. So these are the issues that present itself for any educational uh, establishment across the globe. Nigeria is critical, uh, if I use that. I am, as a person, I am consulting for UNESCO, ECOWAS, for 15 countries in Africa. They've replicated most of the things that I do in Nigeria for adoption in 15 countries that are members of ECOWAS. So working with, um, with groups and then looking at what I've presented, it will be important for all of us to aggregate ourselves so that we can create one family, one educational uh, uh, backbone to push these uh, uh, data providers or network providers to a point where they will allow educational institutions the opportunity to use data so far as it's made for education. Because when I arrived here, my son came back with access to internet that is free for their PS43 uh, uh, class. So it is important that uh, the outcome of this discussion should uh, get the global uh, uh, community to come together and allow opportunities that has to deliver education to our teaming uh, youths to be free so that this thing can work. For developing nation and my country, Nigeria, it will become impossible for people to, who are in remote areas to even have access to the data, talk less of the network. So it is important that uh, the outcome here should be placed on record that uh, Africa needs uh, institutions that can be sustainable so that we can start to groom teachers, train and educate them on the best form of using interactive uh, uh, sessions via uh, online education to reach out to the less privileged and for those that are in the remote areas of Nigeria. Thank you. I hope that uh, 
this will help. Thank you so much, Professor Gregory, for your very inspiring remarks. And as an educator in, leave, in leading your university and students forward. And now we move on to our next panel, um, where we will be talking about management and prevention of global pandemics. And our first speaker uh, is uh, Senator, State Senator Kevin Parker, who is the chairman of uh, the Committee on Energy and Telecommunication from New York State. The floor is now yours, Senator Parker, and thank you for your time. Can you hear now? No, I'll go back and take and just unmute you. Senator uh, Parker, can you hear us? Are you able to log on? Go to the next person. Okay, uh, I'll just wait for a few seconds and then I will call upon another partner of crime of mine, Dr. Judy Kuriansky, who I see is waiting and ready to go. Um, so I'll just wait for a few seconds, but Judy, this is your cue in case the, we have a delay in the Senator coming on. I'm going to have you go. Thank you. Um, okay. So now um, it's my distinct uh, privilege and pleasure to call upon Dr. Judy Kuriansky, who wears many hats so well. But more than that, the best hat I'd like to describe her is that she's a good friend and colleague to work with. Uh, we have been on many journeys. And uh, Judy, look forward to being on this one and others to come to and working as we do to promote the health, health and well-being of women. And um, take it away, Judy, because we really need your expert perspective on how this is affecting all our mental and social well-being. Thank you again for your time. What a pleasure to be here amongst all these distinguished speakers and also to work with you, Minnie, as you said, and Dr. Ada for all the wonderful projects that you have done both of you at the UN and to be on so many side events with you, uh, many about issues related to the sustainable development goals at the United Nations and leaving no one behind, as the ambassador mentioned earlier, uh, the comments that I'm going to make have a lot to do with many of the intersected ideas that have been presented before, Minnie, when you mentioned about the new normal and Danny Glover mentioned about the collective trauma of not only the economic, but the emotional issues. Since I am a psychologist, I will be addressing those. I do represent the International Association of Applied Psychology at the United Nations. I'm a trustee of the United African Congress and a professor of clinical psychology at Columbia University. And I've spent time in Africa doing a girls empowerment camp and many projects and including uh, also um, providing psychosocial response during the Ebola outbreak. Uh, so my comments are going to be about mental health and also focused on the Africa situation, um, which uh, the professor mentioned as well. And so I, I want to um, go to my slides now to show you that this is now Mental Health Awareness Month. And the statistics generally show that there are one in four people who suffer from some sort of mental distress in a year, and that we need to break the silence and the stigma. <clears throat> there are many issues that uh, have to do with mental health that are on many levels, and uh, statistics about the situation of mental health in Africa is that there is tremendous prevalence. I just uh, heard um, Dr. Moti, who is um, the WHO Regional Director in Africa, say it's an uphill battle to serve mental health needs that are great in Africa. And I totally agree, and that's what I'm addressing. The number of years lost to disability is very great. There is a tremendous uh, treatment gap that for the number of people who don't get help who need it, um, and that in fact the workforce is very, very underserved and minimal, very few mental health workers. I've seen that personally in Africa, a low number of trained personnel um, and they have great number of needs for not only training, but emotional support and policy, which we do with the UN that 
Many countries in Africa do not really have the policies that support mental health needs. Um, that in fact, there is a tremendous need for mental health. And uh, we see here that in fact, the number of uh, countries that have been affected by COVID-19 has um, in Africa has grown. That when uh, we at the United African Congress called for uh, attention and sounded the alarm back in February at the United Nations for paying attention to the COVID-19 imminent spread we didn't want it, but it would happen um, in Africa. Uh, there were no cases. And now this is the map that shows, although Africa certainly thankfully does not have as many cases as the others in dark brown show there uh, in the world compared to us in America or in other parts of the world. You can see on the left that there are indeed countries in Africa that have, are, uh, have a high amount of spread like South Africa in the South and Nigeria and Morocco. As I mentioned, the United African Congress, when we did an event at the UN, did sound the alarm about the coronavirus in Africa um, to alert the diaspora group. There you see me at the podium there with Dr. Uh, Mohamed Nurassain, who is the chairman of UAC and a student of mine from China with whom I have worked a great deal because we have mentioned, and the professor uh, Gregory has mentioned about the importance and the needs emotionally and also through tele uh, services for the, the young people. Um, I, as you see on this slide, I perceive in my role in psychology that um, good health and well-being, sustainable development goal number three, um, is at the heart of the sustainable development goals. That is the agenda and document that the governments of the United Nations, as you see on the right, agreed to uh, during the negotiations a few years ago. And that does include education, um, Professor Gregory, and partnerships and food security that, we, that was also mentioned, and all kinds of concerns that the governments decided. I had a lot of conversations and, uh, and negotiations with African nations about the importance of mental health and well-being, which they agreed to. Two other important documents that I want to put in a context for this discussion is universal health coverage that was passed also by the member states just this past September. You see in the umbrella means that no one should be left behind and that the right to health should be accessed by everyone in good quality, acceptability and affordability. And WHO's action plan is also part of uh, these background documents that support this. Very importantly, the UN is now recognizing the importance of mental health. Just the other day, the Secretary General, you see on the left, released a policy brief on Thursday about the need for action on mental health with COVID-19 uh, that was reported in the um, UN News. Uh, having been in Sierra Leone during Ebola, as I mentioned before, you see here, obviously, the people are not physically distancing because um, this was the time of Ebola. Uh, but it is an important message that has to do with stigma. And so the theme there was, I am African. I am not a virus. And this stigma is happening now in the days of COVID-19, where there are people who are calling those who have had the infection corona house or the covid kid so professor gregory this is important for you in terms of education this is a terrible stigma that is being foisted upon people who have contracted the disease and that must be um must be undone there are also myths that per per pervade now in the times of covid that it that pervaded during also the times of ebola that the infection is not real, that COVID cannot take African blood, that it won't survive in the heat. There's a lot of controversy about that. And conspiracy theories that it was caused by the government or international agencies to get money or Bill Gates. And the need for people now who feel abandoned. So emotionally, they feel the government, as was mentioned before, have given subsidies for food, for milk, or even cash. But now um, that is not happening as much. 
these are all the issues emotionally, the distrust in the government that you see on the left, the crowding in the markets, and the um, inability to go to the markets because of the lockdown, but people go anyway. Uh, the children, as Professor um, Gregory was saying before, who have to transition to online learning, which is not available to everyone. The fact that there is um, no ability to, tr to physical distance in the crowded um, villages. The shutdown of the, of the religious organizations that are such an emotional part and spiritual part of the entire community. And the horrors of dealing with people who have died, as you see in the bottom, and how to deal with the loss and the changes in um, the inability to really mourn properly, which is such an emotional thing. So now let me quickly go to some of the things that I noticed that in moving forward as the theme, Dr. Ada, of this conference about the lockdown and beyond, and how do we um, very quickly. So what I notice is that there's tremendous resilience in the African people. It means the ability to bounce back and build back better uh, that was mentioned by the ambassador earlier. The, also the helping each other, which is so heartwarming in Africa, buying or making masks for neighbors who cannot afford them, as you see above, celebrating the survivors and heroes, as you see there, people volunteering when they can give their time to those who need, or need. and a wider awareness of the world beyond. As you see that I have worked many times with in, in work shops with children, when you see children looking at the maps there of other countries who are similarly suffering, which is very, very significant in this time of COVID when we are all suffering in all countries and it is good for children to know about that and everyone. I use a technique about a ball, throwing a ball with a Swahili on it. What is your dream? So that children and adults even have a forward seeking, this looking ahead towards the future, that I have a dream and I can fulfill it. I've documented all of this in the book, The Psychosocial Aspects of a Deadly Epidemic, what Ebola has taught us about holistic healing that is appropriate for COVID-19. And there you see a young child um, in the situation in Sierra Leone seeking safety. So that's another emotional way that we can protect ourselves is to see where and with whom do I find safety, which is so important. Physical distancing is critical, replacing that word social distance with physical distance because research shows, particularly in Africa, that social connection and community connection is critical for resilience and recovery. Wearing masks is important, and I must say that there are reports that we've heard on the webinars that we do for the United African Congress just the other day from reporters in the field that some people are not following those, um, those uh, instructions to use physical masks that we heard about earlier, partly because uh, they don't have the money to uh, purchase them and cannot replace them. Uh, uh, Oxytocin is a chemical that flows in the body when we are when we are close. So if you in the situation of physical distancing, use cuddle things as you see with the children holding um, teddy bears or pillows or anything close or hugging yourself. And when it is okay to have physical contact, then go back to hugging, including for the older people who desperately need it. The point is, some of you may recognize this is the top of Kilimanjaro that I <laughs> ended up climbing a few years ago. I put it here because the idea is that we can get over all the difficulties, and it was very difficult to make that climb through all those rocks and to that high altitude. So we can reach the top. We can um, we can get over these emotional issues that we have by persevering and by finding our inner strength and ultimately our hope as you see here. So I'm going to play for you now a song that my music partner and I, Russell Daisy, who will speak later, um, co-wrote with other uh, collaborators in Sierra Leone. And so you will see that people are together. So let's remember physical distance is important now, but I will end with this song just for a minute um, that will demonstrate the hope that we are looking forward to and that can bring us out of this. Oh, oh my goodness, where did the song go? Um, let's see, I'll get it in a second, here we go. All right, there. So we will survive. 
Okay, so that is what we have to look forward to, that hope is alive in this post-pandemic period we look forward to and in preparing. Thank you very much, Ada, for doing this, Minnie and all the others that have been sharing such wisdom uh, on this webinar. Thank you, Judy. You made us all rock sitting here with that lovely song and with your comments. And before um, I turn on to the next panelist, I just want to say that one of the really important takeaway messages is when you posted that about Kilimanjaro, even though it seems insurmountable, it, it, that you did it. So the same way, just as the COVID pandemic to all of us at this moment may seem insurmountable, but we shall prevail. We need to give ourselves these messages and believe in optimism. My late father always used to tell me that optimism is half the battle won. So on those notes, thank you again, Judy. And hopefully we can hug each other after the COVID is over <laughs> and yeah. go out for lunch, you, me, and Ada, mm -hmm. and plot again. Uh, that being said now, it's my honor to call upon Bob Artis, who's the District Governor Rotary International District. 7090. So thank you so much, Mr. Artis. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for this opportunity to be a presenter with so many distinguished presenters. And I'm just amazed how I got to be on this panel. But I want to give you all just a brief summary of what's taking place. But first, I want to share with you, Madam Moderator, you're giving each of us eight minutes. I have a little elephant here that has a timer on it, and it's four minutes on each side. So I'm timing myself so that I'll keep my comments for eight minutes. Sir, can you unmute yourself, please? I accidentally muted, muted myself. Yeah, so my can you start all over again? Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm very delighted to be among such distinguished presenters. And I was asked to be a part of this program, so I'm going to share with you I'm going to try to be brief, try to be brilliant, and then I'm going to be gone. But there are two objectives that I want to achieve. The first objective is I want to talk to you all as a part of this group. And the second objective is you all are going to listen to me. And I hope I finish talking before you all finish listening. So I want to give you a brief idea of where I'm calling from. I live about 20 minutes from Buffalo, New York and about 30 minutes from Niagara Falls. So those of you that are global partners around the world, you have a sense of where I'm calling into this meeting from. So I'm talking about Rotary. I'm a part of an organization that has about 1.2 million members worldwide, and Rotary has about 33,000 clubs on all continents. And who are we? We are a group of professional, business, and community leaders that come together to take action and make a difference in our world and our communities. Now we talk about the UN. The Rotary was the organization that helped to form the UN. So where was I when this pandemic started? This is one of the most nastiest, infectious, insidious, silent viruses that we've had. Mask and raid, mask and raid around with a code name of COVID. 19. It is shutting down everything. It's trying to shut down Rotary, but it hasn't shut down Rotary. Here's what took place. I'm going to give you a brief narrative. Ambassador Antoine, I was in your country, Grenada, the latter part of February. When I arrived in Grenada, I was met on the tarmac 
from one of the ministers of health. He said to me, are you Mr. Artis? To which I replied, yes, I am. He said, will you come with me, please? So, that, so Ambassador Antoine, I'm thinking to myself at St. George, and I'm clicking pictures of this beautiful island of the airport, Spice Island, so beautiful, so I'm clicking pictures. So I walk into this elaborate room that's obviously wasn't designed for me, it's for ambassadors and people of power. And here I am, a little guy from Buffalo, New York, walking into this room. So this minister of health says to me, two questions he asked. The first was, are you coming in from China? Of which I replied, no, I'm not. The second question was, have you visited China in the last 10 days? And I said, no, I haven't. Then he asked very diplomatically, do you mind if you take your temperature? Now, I'm not familiar with all these modern te techniques, so I opened my mouth for them to insert a temperature thermometer, but he scanned my head and he says, you're okay. Now here's where I'm going with this narrative. Another person walks in and takes my passport, and about five minutes later, they walk me through the, the, the airport, and there's a whole bunch of people waiting to be processed through immigration. And I thought to myself, wow, Grenada is on to something. Well, I was, in Grenada, I was in Grenada for five days. And the day that I departed from Grenada, they closed their borders. They closed their borders. No more incoming traffic. Now, to me, I'm thinking to myself, what's going on? So from, from Grenada, I flew to Trinidad. When I arrived in Trinidad, there were so many people wearing masks. And I'm saying to myself, what is this about? So I suddenly had this epiphany, I better call my district and alert them what's going on. Now remember people, this is in early March before the world really got a grasp of this nasty ass and serious infectious virus called coronavirus. I call my district, which is in 79, now Rotary has about 435 districts, 33,000 clubs. I call my district leadership team and says, hey guys, I'd like to recommend that we cancel all related activities for this Rotary year, which our Rotary year will, will end June 30th. I have so much pushback. Oh, Bob, you're having a knee-jerk reaction. Oh, we're going to do this as usual. Somebody says, Chicken Little is falling from the sky. And I says, my God, how can this be? Grenada has closed its borders, all incoming traffic. And remind you, Grenada is a developing country. It's not a monolithic country like America, Canada, or Russia. It's a small country. But they had the foresight and the wisdom to know that we better close our borders. So let me fast, fast forward. Two Fridays ago, distinguished Antoine, I was in a meeting there with the Rotary Club of East Grenada, and I was informed they've had only six people that have died as a result of this infectious disease. And that was because they had the foresight to close down their borders. Well, let me fast forward again. Here in our district, after I returned to Buffalo, I called an emergency meeting of all of my district leadership team, and I said to them, very prophetically, I need you all to support me in canceling all of the remaining events for our district for the Rotary year ending June 30th. Again, I got pushback. But they finally relented and says, you know, let's postpone the, all the events until the end of April. And I says, oh no, we need to cancel these for the balance of the year. They were canceled and look where we are today. Now my leadership team is telling me, Bob, you made a great decision. We had no idea that this pandemic was gonna be as devastating as it is. But I saw it coming when I was in Grenada. When I left Grenada and went to Trinidad, I saw it coming. So here's what we've done to address the post-pandemic era. Our district is having, and you all are welcome to join us if you'd like to. Every Tuesday evening at seven o'clock, we have a town hall meeting. 
And at this town hall meeting, we have people from around the globe that is sharing with us what they're doing in their communities to make a difference. How Rotary is impacting people of all denominations, of all ethnicity, of all, of all creation, what we're doing in our various communities. We're providing masks and we're providing other essentials for the first line defenders. That's what we're doing in Rotary. Our international convention has been canceled because of this. You know, we aren't having a baseball, we aren't having a soccer, we aren't having a football, we aren't having a baseball. We have to begin to respect what this insidious virus is doing to people by practicing social distancing. What we've done to prepare for this lockdown is simply canceling things until it gets better. Many of our meetings now are done virtually. Virtual meetings has been around for a long time in my business. We interview by virtual meetings. It's been around for years, but now this virtual technology is becoming, it's becoming our norm. This is our way of communicating with people. This is our way of connecting. Hey, y'all, do you know that uh, in the West, we greet people with a hug? We love hugging and we love shaking hands. But in the Orient and Thailand, they have a Y. They don't shake hands. And in Japan, have a slight bow. So in closing, my friends, we have to find another way to greet our fellow mankind. So thank you. I will be around if there are any questions later on. Madam Moderator, thank you for having me thank on the program. It's my pleasure to talk with you. Thank you, um, Governor. And I just wanted to say I'm a Rotary brat because my parents were Rotarians. And I was a interactor and road director. And I have worked with the, my local uh, Rotary here to get a lot of supplies to Malawi. So I have a lot of respect for you. And thank you for your leadership and foresight in practicing social distancing. Thank you, sir. And I hope you don't disappear, but stay on the call. Um, our next speaker is from the United Kingdom. He's Dr. Uh, Menakaya, who is a consultant pediatrician uh, and also the director of Bar Juni and Irene Menakaya Foundation International London. Thank you, doctor, and welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me uh, to this um, uh, special Zoom session. And, um, and greetings from London. Um, I don't know if you can see me okay. Cool. Um, so yeah, you're fine. We can see you fine. Please go ahead, sir. Right. Thank no you. Um, in my talk on prevention framework after COVID, I'll be really discussing um, the rapid spread of this virus uh, very quickly, um, highlighting um, the its global influence um, around the world, and um, perhaps discussing some lessons we might learn for education from responses to other uh, epidemics in the past. I'm just going to share my screen, if that's okay. Um, is that all right? Fabulous, okay, cool. Um, cool. Um, so um, we, we all have seen this, haven't we? The, um, this, this, um, so we've seen these, uh, this picture of COVID, World Health Organization, and I'll just very quickly tell you uh, how it's uh, the timeline. Um, first case is end of December, um, as we've just heard. Um, by 11th of March, it was, it was, um, it was uh, described as an international pandemic. Uh, just yesterday, out of over 2 million people who've been infected, we certainly know that 300,000 deaths have happened and countless millions have been impacted across the world. Um, so here's a global picture of the world. This was made up from early this month, uh, where you can see uh, several hubs, so several you know, uh, key areas for this uh, pandemic from Asia, in Europe, United States, and they're scattering across other continents. 
So what we've seen, this is London in the lockdown period, a whole new vocabulary has been starting. Uh, we now hear of lockdown as part of our routine day-to-day -day work, uh, social distancing or physical distancing, which I think to actually think is a very great, it's a good term to use, uh, rising unemployment across, across all countries, a real effort now on hand washing, uh, test, test, test have been the mantra from WHO, PPEs we've heard about, quantitative easing for the sort of the, um, the bankers amongst us and then um, widespread school closure. So my children are currently being homeschooled. And this clearly is disruptive to everybody. Uh, we've just heard about the impact on the psychology of people. And so our queen has been out really to try and to calm us down using perhaps words from Second World War and telling us we will meet again. So hopefully we'll all come out uh, hugging each other very soon. But how can we think about prevention uh, for COVID-19 as we move forward? And I just take a point to think about chronic diseases that we know of. And about 20 years ago, WHO did a, a report on chronic diseases and mentioned about reducing risks and promoting healthy life. This was from 20 years ago. And the reason for that was their research at the time was that two thirds of all deaths and 43% of global burden of disease were from chronic non-communicable diseases. And fast forward it's around now, they were predicting that three quarters of all deaths and two thirds of global diseases will be from non-communicable diseases, things like uh, blood pressure, diabetes, um, things like high blood pressure, things like uh, chronic obstructive airway disease, and things like obesity. So you can see those things, and I suspect before COVID, this was where things we are heading towards. Um, so what did they do in terms of thinking was the right approach to this 20 years ago? They were really thinking about prevention. So how do we strengthen the prevention and control of chronic diseases like those? Uh, how do we, for those who are impacted on, how do we get them early and reduce premature mortality and morbidity for those people, secondary prevention? And for those who have the, the, the infection or the, the condition, how can we minimize the impact of this disease on them and clearly improve their quality of life? The, real, the, 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 the prediction was that if you can achieve this, you can get probably about three, uh, five or to 10 years of good life from each person who is infected. So what did they do? They raised awareness for chronic diseases and, to, and leverage political capital, implement clear and sustainable international, national, regional, and local policies, promote collaboration, we heard a lot about today, coordination of, of, this, of previous, all, all sorts of uh, control uh, activities, develop systems, some capacity building, regional networks, and international partners, and encourage dissemination of scientific knowledge, experiences, and best practice. So as we move into the new normal, moving away from what we've known to something that is new, scary, and perhaps something that will raise us from, you know, to move us into the new, new world. We are looking at a range of interventions with their particular purpose to reduce risks to health or threats to health. And that's where prevention comes in. What can you do to minimize risks to threats? Because if that were to happen, you remain healthy. So it's, if one is adapting this to education, uh, it's a primary prevention. I'd be thinking really something we know already, hand washing as a, as a potential, but really thinking about policies and practices that should prevent disease in the healthy state, in the healthy individual, not when you're already unwell. And so we've heard of R rate, so prevent infection or reinfection. Clearly the current thinking now is that you should, one infected person should infect less than one person. So that will help smoothen the curve. So promote healthy practices, proper sleeping, balanced diet, regular exercise, hand hygiene, discourage unhealthy habits, uh, eating junk food, teenage smoking, sedentary lifestyles are things really important because we are talking about uh, remote learning, digital learning. You can, the other street for side of that is more sedentary lifestyle. Schools, making sure they are clean so that people do not get infection. 
And uh, obviously when vaccinations are available, we'll probably will offer that to everybody. But none of this will happen if there isn't enough appropriate legislation to enforce these measures to, to, and to uh, promote uh, physical distancing, personal protection equipment, reducing travel and self-isolation. Now, if you're in secondary prevention, this is really about identifying people who are ill early on. So using things like fever scanners in supermarkets in Austria at the moment. Uh, but really, because if you can get that early, then you're likely to reduce the impact of disease. So detect and treat disease as early as possible. Promote measures to prevent infection in the school setting. Uh, so things like getting sure that parents and children have questionnaires, think about temperature checks, making sure that if you identify you're isolated in the school, in the school um, a health center, uh, symptomatic students will have PPEs, you know, schools should upgrade their school health system that perhaps have had lots of funding cuts and a public, uh, clear public health advice. And what of this is a person now who's suffered the illness is being clapped out instead of this on your on your screens now being clapped out of out of out of ITU. But this is really the beginning of the long road recovery. So really, this is meant to reduce the impact of an ongoing illness. So for, think about a child who's got a completely very serious illness who now needs to recover. So what do schools have for those sorts of children? Uh, yes, we're talking about phase re return to school, remote learning, digital learning. But remember, their parents are also stressed and anxious because they've got to care for them. And I think, again, looking at your pastoral and mentoring and healthcare programs in school, really re re redesigning that and refashioning it. And uh, I still keep on you know, thinking about partner as a pediatrician, thinking how can you build that partnership with parents and hospitals and providers of services for, for return to, to health. So really, my, in summary, what I'm trying to say is that you've got any infect infectious illness that is devastating impact globally. Um, it's, there's already expertise in how to limit this impact from other public health epidemics. A prevention framework, in my view, is a way to really ensure a rapid return to normality. And we're just using um, a, a Zoom to do this. And this is really where we'll collaborate and build uh, partnerships. Um, just very finally, um, just on a, on, a, on a positive note, Tom Moore, you may have heard of him in the United States. He started and wanted to do a quick walk to raise a thousand pounds, but he really gingered the whole nation, inspired the nation for a 30 million um, uh, fund for the National Health Service. So really well done to him. But it also tells us that little steps like he took can make a massive difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jude, for that talk. And as a fellow healthcare professional, I think you did a really great job. And uh, the other thing I just wanted to say is, as a pediatrician, I'm sure you're very concerned about the Kawasaki-like syndrome, which is being exhibited by some children. We've had quite a few in New York. And uh, thank you again for all your work and hope you and your family stay safe. Um, and we are moving along. We have four speakers and we also have our own Russell Daisy, who's going to be performing for us. Uh, and I would also like to say that um, I would request the other speakers to kindly keep to time because we have quite a few Q&A. We would like to have at least a few minutes of Q&A. Um, and now we move on to our next panel, uh, which is well-being of, of women and children. And now it's my honor to call upon Dr. Amina Ali. I see she's ready to go. Um, who is the founder of Georgia Reproductive Resource Alliance Center for Education and Empowerment. The floor is yours, Dr. Ali. Thank you. Dr. Ali, you need to unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. So sorry, so sorry. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Dr. Mina Ali. I am coming to you from New York City. I'm one of the first responders here. We are trying to flatten this thing and we are doing so well. Um, we are taking more and more people off the ventilators daily and we are releasing people and one of the things that i am so happy to report is that a lot of what it is that we're going to be going through in the next few weeks is going to be reconditioning and that brings us to the point of what it is that we're going to be dealing with today um, the as you see on the screen the wellness and pregnancy 
And childbirth during crisis has been an affect. I do deal with those that have been left behind, that have been pushed behind and systematically undeveloped intentionally. And these are the women that are dealing with crisis while pregnant. So some of the slides that you're gonna be seeing today is effective specifically for women and children. Also, we'll be dealing with the, um, the counterintelligence, if you will, of what it is that we have been doing proactively, um, um, preemptively, and things that we have been doing prophylactically during this, um, this bender. Uh, one of the things that we have done is we set the tone for, after Katrina, um, my organization wrote the disaster preparedness and readiness program for the state of Georgia for pregnant women. We had so many women that lost their lives as well as the lives of their baby. Uh, during Katrina because there was inadequate care for women. So we use those talents in the COVID Alliance to be able to bring a lot of what it is that we had here in New York to uh, fruition. So let's talk a minute about what is COVID-19. Um, as we have been told numerous times, um, it is um, the novel that was caused by SARS or COVID-2. Um, and this is a mutation of it that is coming out. One of the reasons why we don't have sufficient data on its cure and um, its, its antigen and its um, antibody testing is because it is a novel. It is something that is new and um, not known. So we're kind of learning as we go along. So a lot of the research and the data is real time, which is a good thing because we get to see the progress of what we're doing and what it is that's gonna be setting the standards moving forward. We also get to make mistakes in real time so we can correct them rather than waiting five, 10 years down the line for um, the mistakes to come forward. Uh, the contagion um, is a respiratory virus which spreads primarily through the droplets generated when an infected per person coughs or sneezes. Um, and it could be the saliva or the discharge from the nose. Some of the primary symptoms is cough, of course, um, fever, shortness of breath, and fatigue. That's a huge one, especially for pregnant women, because it's really hard when you're pregnant to understand what it is that is fatigue versus what is illness. And a lot of women go undetected and they actually go to the lower end of, oh, I'll be all right. Um, and they, then they don't seem to get it until it's at its daunting point, um, whether it be detriment to her or the pregnancy. And of course, some of the less common symptoms is sore throat, nasal congestion, muscle aches and pains, diarrhea, headache, and chills. Okay, um, so the next slide will show what it is and how it has affected pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum, okay? Um, we have a few measures that we're gonna see. Um, next slide, please. We have a few measures that we're going to see in what it is that is uh, necessary for us to recognize. Um, the mother-to-child transmission of coronavirus during pregnancy is unlikely, this is unlikely, but after birth, a newborn is susceptible to person-to-person -person spread. So that means once baby is out of this, this um, stasis called the womb or the uterine sac, which is, um, has, I guess, the closest you can call to alkaline environment, um, it is now exposed to the environmental environment that is where people are there. So, of course, the, there's a dire need for us to be even more protected um, uh, personally or, or from the baby and, and especially from the mom, so there isn't any transmission. Um, of course, there's a few data on the clinical presentation of COVID-19, especially in populations such as children and pregnant women, because, again, all of that is real time. And if we're doing statistical solutions in real time, we have to wait and kind of see what happens and do it moment by moment. Findings from a small published educational study suggest that there is currently no evidence for intrauterine infection caused by vertical transmission in women who develop COVID-19 pneumonia, even in late pregnancy. So that means that even if she's in the, in the throngs of it, the, the, there is no data that says that baby will get it. It's more like getting mommy feeling better. Once she gets better, she will throw the antigens and antibodies into baby, which is susceptible to anything that she has. All right, C-section newborns, birth to mothers with uh, suspected probable or confirmed COVID-19 should be treated with person-to-person -person protocols. So that means um, once, once baby, again, is out of mommy and into our environment, um, and I say our environment, meaning the environment outside of the womb, of course, person-to-person -person con uh, contact protocols should be at, uh, adhered to, and especially for newborns with um, compromised immune system by, by organic nature. Okay, next slide. Then we're going to uh, touch on the, um, the necessary pieces to um, 
Okay, yes, postpartum. No, um, we got to do prenatal. You, you went a little too far. We're going to talk about um, childbirth. Childbirth. Yes. Okay, as stated, mother to child transmission of coronavirus through pregnancy is unlikely, but the birth of a newborn is susceptible to person to person, um, e, uh, i.e. doulas, family, religious staff. So these are people that are going to be shunned from the, from the birth room or at least shunned from the environment after uh, pregnancy. So most of the hospitals are going to a father, mother um, scenario. So the father's allowed, maybe um, even the minor children are not allowed because of the transmission and the, the unknown uh, precipitating factors of transmission. Um, as with all confirmed and susp suspected COVID-19 cases, symptomatic mothers who are breastfeeding or practicing skin-to-skin -skin contact or kangaroo mother care should practice respiratory hygiene, which is hand washing, wearing masks, and doing safe distancing when necessary. So once baby falls asleep, take baby off of you, put it in a safer environment, and make sure that while you're breastfeeding and doing the skin to skin, make sure mom is properly masked and donned. Um, we, you know, there was a thing that came up that said, well, babies are looking at mommies and they're gonna see this new mommy in this new environment with this mask on and the baby may be a little unearthed. And I, you know, and I had to remind them that baby sight is only from breast to chin um, at birth. So chances are baby won't even recognize mass by the time she's out of the hospital. Uh, C-section newborns, of course, birth to mothers with sus suspected probable and confirmed COVID-19 should be treated with person-to-person -person protocols, but do not recommend extended distancing as previously noted. Here's why. Once baby is here and, and has acclimated to the environment, we want to make sure that baby gets that proper skin to skin, which is very, very necessary. You can't go back and redo that after baby has lost the, the, the boosters and the immune boosters of being close to mommy. But we do want to limit it in case mommy is a, a variable carrier or she does have the antibody or the antigen in her, I mean, antibody in her and have active um, antigens. Uh, in her of COVID-19. So this is, of course, precautionary measures and things she would have to do when she went home anyway. Speaking of that, once we get to the postpartum piece, COVID positive breastfeeding mothers must isolate from other family members and in between feedings, minimizing the time together by pumping um, and practice person-to-person -person physical distancing from others. So that means once mommy gets home, kind of put her in a room. It's not to isolate her from the family, but just making sure that until the breast milk and the properties of the antigens of the breast milk builds up the baby's immune system, we don't want other people coming in seeing baby and everybody wants to see the new baby and everybody wants to be around baby and bring whatever they don't know they have into baby space. So it's, it's more of a common sense thing, but when we get excited around baby, we tend to forget those things. And that's a natural phenomenon. But we want to remind mommy and daddy to make sure those protocols are set when they go home. Um, as we stated with all confirmed and suspected COVID-19 cases, symptomatic mothers who are breastfeeding and practicing skin-to-skin -skin contact um, should practice hand washing. C-section newborns birth to mothers with susceptible, uh, suspected, excuse me, probable or confirmed COVID should be isolated. But again, the, since she's in a room by herself and she is with baby, um, she can be a little bit more... Um, case managed in what she does with baby um, as far as skin to skin and uh, the proper hygiene. Okay, next. Now this one is my favorite. This one actually is what I, I actually offered to the um, first line of defense here in New York City, which is the breastfeeding aspect. Um, on their site, the CDC states, we do not currently know if pregnant people have a greater chance of getting sick from COVID-19 than the general public nor whether they are more likely to have serious illness as a result. Based on available information, pregnant people seem to have the same risk as adults who are not pregnant. So this was a big question when mommy's talking about, okay, I'm breastfeeding. My breasts are exposed to an area in our house that may be exposed to other people with COVID-19 and will it be susceptible? No, there aren't any statistical data that we can say yes or no, but right now, because of the data we have, we're not seeing any change. We're not seeing any difference in the milk properties. We're not seeing any change in the baby's eating habits or the formulary of what baby is getting as far as the, the antigens from mommy. And we're not seeing a change in the immune system of the baby. So that means it's not going down and it's not going up. So we're seeing it as the same as a breastfeeding mother that is not symptomatic or has an antigen for COVID-19. The site goes on to say breast milk provides protection against many illnesses and is the best source of nutrition for most infants. 
They went on to say, in limited studies, COVID-19 has not been detected in breast milk. This is why we promote it. However, we do not know for sure whether the mothers with COVID-19 may spread the virus via breast milk. The, uh, the understanding is what we're giving right now, this real time right now, is there is no COVID-19 in the breast milk type scenario. So we're saying breast is best because it gives all antigens of what mommy has to baby right away. It gives it in the form of the, the DHA, DHEA um, in, the, in the brain, and it gives the fatty products from the, um, the uh, breast milk and the fatty antigens that babies need. Okay, this is a cited work. Um, and the next slide is going to, um, this is where I got it from John Hopkins um, ACOG, which is also phenomenal. Um, the, oh no, this is, okay, we're missing a slide. Okay, I was gonna, <laughs> that's me, no, I that, didn't want that one. I was going to say that there was supposed to be a slide in between there, and I'll speak to my assistant on that, but I was saying that if you have a pregnant woman and you have a crisis in need, the best thing to do is to have her to do a telemedicine and telehealth um, um, Dr. Rohit Lowe is uh, the mayor of Banjul, and she's going to be coming on talking about it. But we have a telemedicine and telehealth, which is a difference. Um, the, of course, the telehealth is the inclusive care, and telemedicine is specific practicums that are going to be offered in the um, Republic of the, of the Gambia that is going to be given um, the opportunity for mothers to be able to be seen remotely so that she will be able to be determined whether she is needing to go in, whether she is to isolate in place, or whether there should be some parameters that are to be offered in her community. And this is going to be the first of its kind, and I'm very, very excited um, to offer that. So that'll be the first in the Republic of the Gambia after this COVID uh, shelter in place is lifted. We will be traveling there, setting it up in the um, Lower River region, and be able to uh, offer this um, uh, ideally. So I thank you so very much for your time, and I thank you so much for allowing me to present this. That is my um, points of contact, if anyone want to take Take a picture of the screen so you'll be able to reach out to me directly and be able to see some of the things that we're doing in real time for the mothers um, here in the United States as well as the diaspora. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali, for all your work. And as a uh, obstetrician, I, uh, I'm an obstetrician and I think I really salute you for your work you're doing and your passion and also your compassion, uh, Dr. Ali. And I look forward to connecting with you because I think this is something Ada and I, we could talk as to what you're doing with you in Gambia. That being said, and thank you again, because we need more people like you in the trenches. We are all in the trenches one way or the other. Uh, so now it's my privilege to call upon the Honorable uh, Rohini Malik, uh, Lord Mayor of Banjul, Gambia. Uh, the floor is now yours, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Allow me first and foremost to thank the organizers for inviting me in this important forum. My sincere thanks goes also to Dr. Ada and her team. I'm coming to talk about uh, how can community service organizations help women in rural communities and also how to help women Did we lose her? We can't hear her audio. Oh, I think we lost her. Oh, wow. Dr. Amina, I think we lost her, right? Yeah, let me see. Let me see if I can get her back. Oh, wow. Okay. She may have to log out and log back in. Hold on. Okay. Oh, see, no. that's the, the thing about technology. It has exactly. its quirks. But we move on. We bring him. Yeah. That's what we bring him. Okay, go forward and we'll have her come out, go out and come back in. Sure. Okay, I'll, okay. Um, you know what? While we are waiting for her, I just want to um, ask our Q, our other next two speakers to get ready in the other panel where we're going to be discussing the role of community service organizations. Dr. Monica Sanchez, I would like you to be ready as also uh, Mr. N uh, Guy Dijokin, the president of the U.S. Federation of UNESCO Club Centers and Associations. Uh, Madam Chairperson, I'm sorry, that was ready. my network. Oh, great. Oh, Thank you. There she is. Okay, okay, okay. Thank okay. you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Madam Chairperson, community service organizations need to provide adequate social protection 
and support to small vulnerable women farmers. That's headers, fishmongers, and those that are involved along food chains. This is of key importance during and after this crisis to avoid any food shortages and disruption that might be triggered by logistical hurdles, labor shortages, and panic buying. Madam Chairperson, if people are not well sensitized, they will end up having insufficient information, thereby causing panic, which can result to be more disastrous than the virus. This is where community services need to double up their efforts to, adequate, to give adequate information to the people at the rural, rural areas. When restrictions are implemented that require reduced mobility, many will suddenly lose their source of li livelihood. This is where community service organizations become relevant in food distribution to such groups, considering the fact that the vast majority of the rural people are poor and are not covered by health insurance or income protections, such as paid sick leave or employment benefits. They therefore will likely face food and nutrition insecurity. Madam Chairperson, in the rural areas, mobility is already a big problem. And reducing it means a multiplied problem for the women in the rural areas. However, if you look at uh, the, the structure in the Gambia, one such organization is the local Red Cross Society which apart from distributing food and sanitizers in the rural communities, has also been in the forefront of dispelling people's perception about the pandemic. The organization does this in a number of ways through its network of regional societies and volunteers who are able to collect information on people's perception of concerns about COVID-19. They have been rolling out a needs surveys of fragile and hard hit communities where women are more vulnerable. Some CSOs are faced with tackling migrants from nearby countries who take advantage of the porous borders. They are also the internal displaced persons. These IDPs forcibly displace from their homes and habitual residents live in crowded, unsanitary conditions, in camps, in formal settlements, in the rural areas, with limited or very poor areas to health services. The resources allocated to keep camped, to keep camped residents nourished, safe and healthy are often insufficient to meet the consistent needs of all. Madam Chairperson, people living there have limited opportunities to earn money or access clean water and health care, even in pre-COVID-19 times. All the CSOs being aided by the health ministry to cope with refugee camps, which are already under strain, as they respond to high volumes of women, children and men in need of care for health conditions like malaria or tuberculosis, to name a few. They are not, however, equipped to provide specialized respiratory care as this new disease demands. In a nutshell, it is important to say that community service organization is important to the rural people when there is an emergency. Madam Chairperson, before I dwell into the other topic, let me just explain here what exactly I want to say. If you look at the structure, at least let me take it in the context of Gambia here. We have a serious problem because first and foremost, the people at the rural areas has even problems before we talk about the COVID-19. When we talk about healthcare, they are lacking behind. When we talk about education, they are lacking behind. When we talk about uh, self-sufficient, uh, food self-sufficient, even though they are the farmers, but they are still the, the people who are on the disadvantaged side. So basically, we will all agree that COVID-19 has ambushed us. But at least in the developed countries, they were prepared a, 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 a bit 
When I said a bit, it means the health sectors were, were are good, they have very uh, 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 good education system, uh, etc. But look at it in the context of Gambia, where now we are saying social distancing, if you like, physical distancing. And then schools have closed totally. So we are saying, or the Minister of Education is saying, learning in distance. Learning in distance, who are going to benefit? It's only people that are in the urban areas or people who are at least rich. Because the people at the, at the, at the, at the rural areas cannot afford to buy a laptop. They cannot afford to buy an iPad. Some people, they, they, are not even, they cannot even, they even does not have internet. So how can they learn from distance? So these are the kind of problems that the rural areas are having. But again, um, um, let me just dwell into my other topic. So maybe I will start making sense when we talk about the, 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 the women at the rural areas. But again, I want to thank the, the CSOs, that is the Red Cross and even the Rafaela, who are extremely doing extremely well in the, in the rural areas. Um, how to help women at the rural areas to adjust to COVID-19, bearing in mind that they have to access, they have no access to internet. Madam Chairperson, firstly, lack of internet creates information blackouts, make it imp impossible of sending messages through smartphones. Women in rural communities need information to be aware of recent information. Therefore, internet restriction threatens public health. It hinders access to timely and accurate information about the COVID-19 pandemic. And the best practices guidelines like shelter in place, social distancing, and washing hands. These limitations also mitigate people's abilities to evaluate the risks and to be better prepared. Again, this was just what I, uh, what I was just saying. Those people, whether we like it or not, they have insufficient information. There is an, another side. Uh, a positive Excuse side me, uh, Madam Mayor, sorry to cut in. Could you please wrap up in two minutes? We have two more speakers, a musical interlude and a lot of q and I'm so sorry for interrupting you, ma'am. Okay, then uh, let me just leave it there, ma'am, then. Uh, just to say thank you very much for No, 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 you me. have two more minutes. Please go ahead, uh, uh, Mayor. Please go ahead. You have two more minutes. Thank you. Okay. Please, please. It's very interesting. It's not that I have to be the, uh, what shall I say, the strict person here because of the time. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, as I just said, uh, rural women are very vulnerable during this period in the absence of internet, radios, and televisions. Uh, 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 televisions, radios, and televisions are the only communication tools to convey messages to rural communities. Rural women are likely Anybody, like anybody else, and need to follow the prescribed precautionary measures to adjust to the pandemic. Social protection system must be incorporated in communication to keep women safe within their low-income and fragile rural communities. But the good thing is community radios are entrusted to develop cultural appropriate messaging in local languages. They encourage more information sharing and collaboration between community radio, journalists, and district-level health and agriculture experts. This will align messaging around prevention and access to essential services. Furthermore, sharing information can collectively create solutions to address barriers and changes faced by community members. Just let me just stop here. And um, I cannot end by not saying that the coronavirus has also come with its positive, uh, with, with some positive effects. Simply. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Now we move on to our last panel of the day, but in no way the least. That's the role of community service organizations, best practices for nonprofit workplace. I would like to call upon Dr. Monica Sanchez, cultural ambassador, founder of the Miss Caricom Foundation International. Thank you, Monica. It's always a pleasure to see you and work with you. So uh, you have five minutes and then uh, because we also have another speaker after you and we have our own Russell Daisy giving us some music. So over to you now, uh, Monica. Thank you again.
Can you unmute yourself, please? We can't hear you, Monica. Thank you. <laughs> technology. We all try to get to the age of technology. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Thank you. I just want to say good afternoon to everyone. I am really um, grateful and thankful to Dr. Ada for putting this program together. Uh, Ms. Karakam, always want to be part of community service. We're talking about cultural rest practice and community service organization. And this is so interesting because uh, we are community-based organization, NGOs, non-governmental organization. And uh, most community-based organizations are structured within the local communities. Uh, we interact more directly with the citizens in cultural environment. So um, it is, it is uh, more accessible for us to communicate with, uh, with the regular citizen because when you're dealing with cultural issues, for example, you have organizations that um, advocate for environment, advocate for health as we just heard, advocate for women's rights, which is the CSW. You have 1.5 million NGOs attached to the UN. Um, economical development. We know that all these issues right now are creating confusion because we are in a new, we are new way of life, a safe way of life, but it's a very new way of life. So the changes create a lot of confusion because we have so many different cultural groups. Most of these informations are given in English at a certain time to a certain group. So how do we get the massive of people, how do we reach out to other cultural groups for them to be engaged? As the Lord Mayor just said, and I recently came back from the Gambia, hi Lord Mayor, that her rural women is, uh, is, 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 has no access to a lot of the services, the information, the restriction, the rules that's supposed to be apply right now. So it's up to local community service organization to reach out, to go out there and to get in touch with these groups because they're, most of these groups are aware of an organization that is uh, associated with them. Um, an organization formed directly to advocate for whatever issues they're having. So they, they're familiar with that organization and it's more of a comfort zone for that organization then to share information with them, continue to advocate for them, continue to look for resources and help to make that this whole process a little bit more bearable. We have community, say, community service organization and the relationship right now between the disaster and community. You know, we, we have to comply now. We have compliance right now. We have adjustment and we have support. The compliance that we have, a lot of restriction, social distancing, the covering of our face, and a lot of other things that we are supposed to do in order to comply right now with the quarantine and all of that. A lot of these groups, as Mr. Glover spoke earlier, do not even have resources, uh, washing hands. Some some communities don't even have water to drink, much more to wash hands. So it's up to these groups now to advocate and to try to find a middle ground, maybe hand wipes, maybe, um, maybe um, hand sterilizer to try to get it to them, to advocate. So it's very necessary because these communities won't even know where to go or what to do, or some don't even have a language barrier to understand the information in English. What is- So sorry, Monica, for jumping in. Uh, you have like uh, uh, one and a half minutes to wrap I'm up. Just to stop 30 seconds. I'm watching a clock right now, so I'm on point. I mean, I, I, I don't appreciate the fact that you keep jumping in, you're using up some of my time. But my, my, um, my, uh, you can, you can uh, look online for the rest of my presentation. Um, I thank Dr. Ada for allowing me to be here and you can go ahead and use the rest of your time. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. It was not at all my intention to be rude in any way, but I am also getting messages that the Zoom I don't thing get... is going on. All so right. I, I just want all to right. say that it's not my intention to be rude. You said I was jumping in, so I just want to make that clear. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I, I'm involved. sorry. It's not, my, you know, I'm asked to moderate. I'm doing my best here. If we had more time, we've had some technical glitches. My apologies. Our next, and thank you again for your comments as always. Our next speaker is Mr. Guy Dijokin, President of the U.S. Federation of UNESCO Clubs, Centers, and Associations. He's also the permanent representative of World Federation of UNESCO Clubs, uh, Centers, and Associations. So over to you now. Thank you. And again, please, I'm not being rude, but I would like you to tailor your remarks because we also have uh, a musical interlude and Q&A, and we need to wrap up in the next 15 to 16 minutes. Thank you all for understanding. I'm trying to do my best here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I would like, first of all, to thank uh, Dr. Ada for convening and working so hard to uh, put this panel together. And um, of course, all of you, my brother and friend, Ambassador Antoine and uh, uh, you know, uh, Mon Ambassador Monica and everybody. So this is a great opportunity. Um, in the last two months, we've been <laughs> working from the basement, from here and there. Uh, but it's a great opportunity for us as human beings to, uh, as we move forward, to actually rethink about uh, what is it all means to be a human being. We are talking about the role of community service. And uh, I initially planned to talk about, uh, you know, the history of community service, but we all know that uh, as human beings, we've been on this earth for tens of thousands of years. And uh, initially, it was just like, uh, you know, we were thinking about ourselves, right? Um, the survival was me, 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 and me, just with, like you see so many of the other species doing. Species doing. But uh, it came a time where we kind of realized that uh you know being alone it doesn't matter how strong you are you know you will need another person and then human beings just quickly realize that it will be better for us to live organized you know to 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 be my brother's keeper and my sister keepers and that's why uh, we that's the origin of community uh first of all living in community and later on uh having what we call today community service before uh, we had the political structure there and then we have uh, the religious structure and the religious structure was telling you what god was telling us to do okay we had to kind to your body you had to kind you had to do this but you were doing that solely because you wanted to hope god in paradise in the when you know whenever we leave this earth but i will really pass forward to the 21st at the end of the second uh, in the second world war uh, when we had the uh, no, first of all, when we have the the, the, the industrial development at the 19th century, I mean 19th century, where we start having cars, all these, you know, people were so, you know, marvel about the progress. But unfortunately, after the two wars, that in 1940 and 1940, people realized that that technology that was actually going to help us be better human beings actually had in the germs that could actually become the destruction of our humanity as we know so how do we do about that you know how do we handle this technology so people started organizing you know and having uh, what and then people realized that you know we needed to have people start thinking about the effect of all this uh, 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 technology that you were supposed to be helping us be a better human being so um then came the, the the some of the worst farming in the world and then people started wondering about how to have those who were having more money were keep accumulating more money and the poor those who were poor were getting poorer and poorer and poorer and there came a moment where the the poorest one had to organize organize in a very structured way in order to face those who had enough, those who have enough. And that's when um, we started seeing the rich people giving charity, you know, in order to buy a way to heaven when they get up there. And other people coming to say, you know what, 
charity that is not going enough because it will never lift people out of that poverty, out of where they are. And, and we have the term of charity, giving charity to someone and maintaining where they are versus empowering them by getting them to find ways to empower their lives and get better and take care of themselves. So those are some of the concepts that I wanted to elaborate more, but in this real time, I'm just going to go very quickly. Then in the 21st century, we still have, we start having our first millionaire, our first billionaire and people becoming rich and rich. And we have people today that 1% of the whole world could actually buy the whole world. They have more resources than all of us combined. And our community, you know, that used to have some principles, we need to have concepts like the human condition. You know, in the 19th century, 20th century, there was a term called human condition. And the, at the heart of that was the question, why are we on this earth as human beings? Yeah? What's the purpose of being alive? Is it to be my brother's keeper? Is it to be my sister's keeper? Or is it about amassing enough fortune so that you know we could you know we could buy almost everything and one day leave that behind? So the, my proposition was that until we understand the purpose, until we make that trip inside us and realize that the purpose of life is about lifting all of us higher we will not we will keep having situations that are going to come like the one we are facing right now we have strayed away from the overall mission that we had as human so the role of community service is to remind our brothers and sisters that regardless of where we came from we are in this all together and there's a famous quote from ray Kroc, the the founder of uh, uh, for McDonald's, I'm not promoting McDonald's, but he says something that I found very interesting. He once said that none of us is as good as all of us. And I think that that summarizes what community service should all be about. And it's first the 21st century. But excuse me, uh, Mr. Do uh, Dijokin, not to interrupt you or be rude, sir. Um, I'm just getting signals. Can I request you to wrap up in a minute because we have a musical interlude. Again, this is personally not. I just want to make it clear to all the panelists. I am not interrupting. I'm just requesting as I'm playing a moderator role. And I do this very often. Please, sir, thank you. Uh, and again, can you kindly wrap up your uh, great remarks in one minute so that we have our next presenter? Thank okay, you, I said uh, I was just summarizing Ray Kroc. That was my last thing because I was in the, watching the time saying that none of us is as good as all of us. And as we go through this pandemic, we should again be thinking about how we could face this together. And we learned that the virus didn't recognize countries, wealth, and all these things. That in a good way for us to know that we should be our brothers and sisters keepers. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this panel. Thank, thank you so much. Again, thank you for your remarks and all the work you're doing and hope to meet with you in the UN after the lockdown. Thank you again. And my apologies if I had to uh, cut you short, but we had technical difficulties. We are, uh, you know, way past 1 p.m. And now it's my privilege to call upon our own Russell Daisy. I see you're wearing a mask, Russell. You must be outside. Thank you for uh, doing everything needed to uh, stay safe. And over to you for your interlude, musical interlude. And Russell is an international pianist, singer, and songwriter. Thank you again, Russell. The floor is yours now. Oh, thank you, Minnie. Uh, and thank you to all of you from all over the world for your uplifting words. Uh, a song that I'm going to play is a video. Uh, it started out as a song written during um, Ebola, and it was called Hope is Alive. Here is the new My version. brothers and sisters, we're going through so much, seeing so much, and feeling so much, even though the road ahead is unknown let us all remember we are survivors yes i'm a survivor pandemics 
survivor in the COVID-19 war. And I survived. I'm going through pain. I've been contained. But I'm a survivor. So I'll survive. So there is Corona affecting our planet. A silent killer who's changed our lives to keep us apart. Tear us apart. But we are survivors, so we'll survive. We gotta sing together, sing together. Hope is alive. We gotta love each other, love each other. Hope is alive. We gotta breathe together. We gotta laugh together, love each other. Hope is alive. I help you, you help me. Hope is alive. He helps her, she helps him. Hope is alive. We gotta sing together, sing together. Hope is alive. We gotta rock together, rock together. Hope is alive. We gotta breathe together, breathe together. Hope is alive. We gotta laugh together, love each other. Hope is alive. We gotta kick Corona, kick Corona. Hope is alive. We gotta fight Corona, fight Corona. Hope is alive. My brothers and sisters, we still have hope. And once COVID-19 dies, we and the world will rise again. Hope is alive. Hope is alive. Hope is alive. Thank you so much, Russell. You are Any so comments? I hope you saw it, Minnie. <laughs> this is what? my first. I hope you saw it and heard it. This is my first webinar. I did. Thank you so much. And thank you again. It's always a pleasure to work oh. with you. And uh, because we are running out of time, uh, the, the, the question and answers will be answered and emailed to all of you who signed up to participate. Thank you again so much. And uh, on behalf, and I would like to um, give a big shout out to Ada. Thank you, Ada, for your brilliance and hard work uh, for always making things happen. And I would like to thank the following organizations who work to make this program a success. The Africana Women Working Group at the UN, um, which is a network of uh, ECOSOC NGOs at the United Nations. The CICA, CICA International University and Seminary Center based in Canada and New York. The Center for SDG Global Education in USA. Tomorrow's Women for Development Organizations based out of Nigeria. The African Cultural Programs, Inc. Ms. CARICOM International Foundation. And last but not least, the Bard Juni and Irene Irene Menekaya Foundation and all of you, our audience, thank you for being there. And it was a privilege to serve as your moderator. And again, I just want to be very clear. It was not my intention to cut in, but because time is running out and I was getting messages from the organizers, I have to do it. So thank you all. Stay safe. And Ada, do you want to say something? Okay, uh, the other thing Ada wanted me to convey to everybody is apart from thanks that uh, she will be planning a, another event in the middle of June to discuss uh, the, uh, the health of African children and education. And thank you again. And uh, thank you so much Ambassador Antoine too for staying on and Judy and uh, Professor Gregory and uh, Ambassador Guy Dokin, our, uh, the mayor from Gambia, uh, Dr. Ali, uh, Monica Sanchez and uh, everybody else, I and also our senator, um, and of course, Mr. Danny Glover, uh, Senator uh, James, and our Reverend Teresa Morton, and um, uh, Professor Gregory. I thank you, Judy, again, and uh, uh, the Rotarian Bob Aris. The reason I'm calling Judy is because she's a dear friend. Instead of saying Dr. Koreansky, I hope I didn't insult you, Judy. Um, and Russell, I mean, what can I say about your music? And also Dr. Jide, uh, thank you so much uh, for your talk, Dr. Ali. And again, Honorable um, uh, Mayor Roni Malik, 
I look forward to meeting with you and look forward to working with you closely, Dr. Ali. And also, um, thank you, everybody. Uh, stay safe. And it's 107 and we are done. And we will get thank back you. to you with the questions. Thank you.